Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to cover topics models, which is a follow-up to a video on latent semantic analysis. So this is mainly for my students right now in my Analytics 540 class, but the entire course is coming soon. So for right now, let's talk about topics models. So in this lecture, I'm going to cover an expansion of semantic vector space models into topics models. So in our previous lecture, we covered latent semantic analysis and the sort of basic ideas that um, semantic vector spaces of what they are and what they do, uh, talking about distributional models. And we're going to extend that now into topics. Talk about the different types of relations that words and concepts can have that help us understand topics and reading and how to differentiate um, these different types of models. So to get started, I want to talk to you a little bit about thinking about how people understand sentences. And so I'm really going to relate this to some research by Walter Kinch, who um, really kind of founded this idea of like thinking about meaning building for discourse. Right? So we have to, when we're reading or hearing, listening, retrieve concepts from memory. So the concepts that are being activated, the words on the page, there's always the printed discourse. And from that, we are pulling out the sort of semanticity of the definitions of those words. We're um, pulling in background information or inferencing into the text. That's a really dynamic process based on the new and incoming information. So um, we're pulling these concepts from memory and um, putting away ones that we've realized are wrong and pulling up new ones. So it's, it's very interactive. And we're going to use our sem the semantic context that we're building to create a gist representation. A gist representation is sort of a picture of the text or the, the understanding, the underlying meaning of the text. We'll talk about the mental model of it rather than remembering each individual word, um, which research has shown that we don't do, we drop all of that and create this sort of picture of the data or of the discourse, too much statistics, um, where reading is actually a lot like building a statistical model where we put together all the pieces and then we have to interpret it. Well, reading is an interpretation of all of the different words pulled from memory um, rather than a representation of each individual data point. However, things often can be ambiguous or there are words with multiple meanings. And so pulling the right information from memory is improved if we think about what might come next. So last week we talked a little bit about expectancy generation um, and we've talked about this with priming as well, where whatever we're currently reading or thinking about can lead us to um, have an expectation of what's coming next. And so if I see doctor, I might expect a word related to doctor to come next, like nurse. And this is really true of the more active reading process because people are, are um, always predicting the next several words coming, coming up based on the meaning of what's going on and maybe word co-occurrence. So these are the words that tend to come into those grammatical slots. And this really is tied to everything we've covered this semester about collocates, collexemes, bigrams, pick your favorite um, definition, uh, your favorite term for that. And the idea is that there are combinations that are more frequent than others, and that allows us to generate an expectancy of what's next, which allows us to read faster and easier, okay? or even to understand faster and easier. So we, we do this sort of active prediction of what's coming next. And that might be, for example, the word bank, it might prime federal and reserve because these are related, but in another context, it might prime bank and fishing. I'm sorry, river and fishing. <laughs> bank might prime itself as well, but um, bank might prime river or fishing. Okay. So multiple senses can make this sort of process difficult and context of the words around it really help disambiguate those um, those problems. Um, and just representation 
creates these overarching topics, which is the purpose of today's lecture, but these overarching mental model pictures that help us deal with these ambiguities and sense. So there's some really famous work too about if you tell people what a paragraph is about, that schema, that gist, uh, can help them understand the paragraph, whereas if you don't, people have a hard time understanding it. So there's a really good case of, um, of um, if you talk to people about washing clothes, right? So you show them this paragraph, tell them most about washing clothes, they're gonna have a much easier time with it than if you just show them a paragraph that talks about you must first sort items into groups or else a mistake can be had. <laughs> and so um, we use just representation for a lot of different things. And the idea behind topics models is they allow us to pull out that gist um, mathematically. So there's four different ways to think about relation that will allow us to create these sort of models. Um, we could have word concept relations. And this is our knowledge about how words refer to some sort of concept. So for example, the physical letters dog refer to the actual worldly concept of dogs. So mine, for example, is asleep on her pillow next to me taking a snooze. If you've watched my channel for a while, you know that she likes to pace around the room when I record these videos. Um, and so I know that that word on the page refers to this physical object um, or uh, just the definition of the concept. Okay, so con when I see concept, we're talking about a little more abstract word, meaning physical word on the page. Uh, we can also have concept concept relationships. It's our understanding of is a and has a relationships. And we talked about Collins and Loftus and Collins and Cullians type model, types of models, hierarchical is a has a relationships um, that also WordNet is built on, where you can have things like dog is an animal. Uh, concept concept relationships can also just be the understanding of how dogs and cats are related, right? They're both animals. And then next, there could be concept precept or concept action relationships. This is more about understanding the, the features of concepts, which we also talked about last, uh, last week and a couple weeks ago about categories, how people build and understand categories. So f you might consider um, a list, a checklist of features for categories. And so, for example, dogs are furry. It's currently summer here. So... Dogs are shedding everywhere. It's like vacuuming every day, right? And they also bark. Right now, they snore. And then last, at the lowest level, which is kind of most useful for these types of semantic vector models, is that there are word-word relationships. And this is where words co-occur because you know a word best by the company it keeps from uh, last week's lecture. And words that co-occur together tend to be either related to the same things, related to each other, or have the same meaning. So from left to right, kind of a summary of a couple of different models that we've talked about. And the first one, more of our bubble network type models, where we can, um, this would be more Collins and Loftus, where we can represent um, words as their nodes, and the relationship between nodes is represented by the lines. And so we would know that bank is related to both Federal Reserve and river, river banks and streams because they have a connection between their nodes. We also talked about spreading activation, how when one word is activated, it sort of trickles down and activates its other words that are connected to it. And that helps us with expectancy generation because uh, the word is the next word to be activated. B here is a pictorial representation, much like our plot neighbors function from latent semantic analysis, where we can create, uh, take uh, two dimensions in this case and um, plot all the words related to bank. And this would allow us to see which ones are closest and which ones are furthest. So you can see that the, the money words tend to lump together and then the more river words lump together. And then we end up actually with a grouping of, of kind of forest drilling related words. Okay. So 
almost we can begin to see topics here. But what we're seeing is the co-occurrence in documents, right? And so within those dimensions, what we've kind of seen is that when we're talking about banks as in money, we get reserve loans, commercial deposits. When we're talking about banks as in river, right, we're getting more deep field stuff. And then we, and we kind of actually end up with an interesting um, <clears throat> kind of third grouping of, of drilling. And the last one over here on the right, this is a topics model representation where uh, the topics are sort of like the dimensionalities that you might see in an LSA model where each word is related to a specific topic. So topic one here has bank and money pretty heavily represented. Topic two has kind of a um, the representation of river banks. Topic three here has kind of the representation of oil. And then we also could rep pick the high, most related words for each topic. Um, and so you can kind of see that these all have very similar veins and that they're trying to understand how word co-occurrence and word relationships um, allow us to see what's going on in the discourse. Um, but I would say underneath it all, underneath the hood, they're pretty different. So let's get into that. Okay. And so it's really useful to understand these models, kind of how they at least somewhat relate and are different because they kind of predict different ways to think about semantic memory. Although I would argue that their kind of core arguments are that you know the words, you know uh, a word by the company it keeps, right? So we can understand relationships by thinking about co-occurrence, maybe in different ways. Uh, and that builds us up into meaning. Okay, so if I can think about word, word, co-occurrence, that would lead me to co concept, concept of co-occurrence. Okay. So what are people doing when they're reading and how do we represent that? Because with a semantic vector space model, we were really talking about um, how we know things mean the same thing, um, or at least are used in similar ways because they co-occur in the same types of documents around the same types of other words. Whereas topics models is really more about what is the representation of this document? What topic does it represent or what dimension, if you want to think about it that way? Um, and how do we understand that topic? So when people are reading, they're translating words into their broader, more abstract concepts. This might be based on categories. It might be based on definitions. So we're, we're taking words from their printed form to their conceptual form. We're using that background knowledge that we all have to pull in other related concepts. So you know it wouldn't be a good lecture without a sports analogy. So um, let's say that we've decided that we're reading an article about football well, for me, the, the, the base knowledge would be American football because I'm a huge college football fan. And so I would start pulling in other related concepts that I know are important, like, um, let's say, penalties and touchdowns and um, I don't even know anymore because it's, it's summer, it's baseball season. But um, let's say I'm reading along and then I suddenly am seeing like things like penalty kicks and I'm like, wait, Wait, is this right? And then um, uh, yellow cards. I'm like, wait, nope. This is a European version, so or, or the rest of the world, the rest of the civilized world's version of, of football. We're talking about soccer, and so disambiguating sense depends on the context of the other word. So I'm I might pull in both concepts until I have enough information to disambiguate. Right. Um, and I would use word co-occurrence in the document to predict the next words I would expect to see. And all together, I would drop the individual words and create a just representation. And some of the cool things that topics analysis allows us to do is to build that just representation without actually reading. So what is it that it that topics models sort of propose that people do, or the people who wrote these models, what is the purpose of having such a model? And the idea is that people are predictors. We predict what word comes next or concept 
is going to occur in this document because it helps us with retrieval and building our mental models. So we're predictors. We also spend a lot, we as humans, when we're reading, we're, we're disambiguating because there are many words with multiple meanings and multiple senses. So how can we understand which one is the appropriate one? And we're also creating that just representation by using some of this prediction, this disambiguation, pulling in other context, inferencing, which is the process of, of relating this to other um, non-mentioned topics. And this creates this coherent representation of the text. So now we've got a mental model and not the individual words anymore. And so I often ask students to tell me, what's your favorite book, right? So when people describe their favorite movie or their favorite book, um, they give you the, the general overview, the broad swath of it. And so that is what just representation is supposed to be, is the sort of um, two line sentence about what something is. And so you've lost all the individual words and now we have just this gist. If we could run an analysis that would give us those keywords, we could classify much faster or um, simply sort into different piles, if you will, to know which documents are related and which ones are not. So a little bit of comparison point here between last week's lecture of relate and semantic analysis and this week's lecture of topics models. And uh, the general idea is that a latent semantic analysis is based on dimensionality. So we have a words by dimension space that we've created using singular vector decomposition, um, which is multiplied to sort of by the matrix of dimensions by dimensions. This is the weight, weights matrix. And those dimensions are represented in documents. So we've got words in dimensions. And remember that dimensions are sort of the, we talked about this as the crunched down picture of all these documents. And each document has a set of dimensions okay, and a weighted matrix that helps us understand all of that. Okay. That's kind of created from or into, kind of working either way here, um, uh, words by documents matrix. So when we started, we created this words by documents matrix. Right? Then we put it through hell and back, right? So we waited it for um, the uh, sort of inverse density and log, and then we ran singular vector decomposition on it, and then we converted it back. And what we ended up with was this, was this idea that we had the relationship between documents, if you looked by columns, or the relationship between words here by rows, and we could calculate coherence or cosine on those because we had converted them um, by understanding the dimensionality of, of the word space. Okay. In a topics model, um, similar idea here, you'll see that these skinny matrices are um, a same idea. The weighting happens um, as part of the singular vector decomposition but with a topics model, we actually are working on probability distributions rather than weighted co-occurrences. And the ultimate goal here is to get the probability of the words given the topic, how many other topics you pick, you'd get to decide. Uh, or we could get the probability of the topic given a document. Make sure I did that the right way, yep. Um, and so what we end up with is a words by documents are we creating a words by documents matrix that's a probability distribution of words rather than a transformed co-occurrence that's kind of, like I said, been to hell and back, um, where we uh, can see what are the most popular words by topic and what are the most, uh, in each document, what are the most popular topics. And the matrix we're gonna end up creating is this words, words by documents probability distribution rather than a co-occurrence distribution. Um, so like I said, there are some, some clear similarities here um, about what kind of happens to make this work and what they're positing as an th uh, underlying theory is different. So some quick other thoughts. One thing I can do with the topics model is reveal the topics. It's like magic, right? So we can figure out what are the most likely uh, topics in a document. However, you still have to interpret that. It doesn't just like pop up and go, this is about football. It'll show you words that are related to football and you would make that inference. 
So there's still a little bit of interpretive dance here. Or we could use this as a classification scenario to sort texts into different groups based on their topics, their most probable topic. Uh, and that would be similar to doing sort of like a clustering or classification analysis. We're kind of finding the natural groups in a corpus or in a set of documents. <clears throat> Much like um, if any of you use the website Goodreads or even Netflix does this, it recommends different books or movies to you based on what you've looked at previously. So it's correlating the topics between those to help predict what you might like next. So a little bit of math here. We're gonna do a couple of types of topics analyses, but most of the most common way to do this is latent direct, derelict, derelict, derichlict, derichlet. I have no idea. I have actually never heard this pronounced aloud because <laughs> everybody calls it LDA, which is what we're gonna do from here on out. It's definitely the most popular type of math for this um, analysis. Although I will show you a couple of other ones. And the key here, um, and thank you Julia Silge for her tidy text chapter on this. This lecture is taken from the Griffiths article that's included in the notes for this week. Um, the tidy text chapter on LDA and topics, and then some other scattered sources on understanding topics analysis, but I think she's probably said it best that the idea is that every document has a mix of topics and every topic has a mix of words. And that's what this picture shows us. And from um, a probability distribution of words by documents, we can, forwards or backwards, create the, understand those um, topics and then the topics within a document. And the really nice thing about this is that it allows topics to overlap. And I think this is key because in a document, and if it has, if a single document has multiple topics and it didn't overlap, that would be very incoherent when reading because it would suddenly switch and be like, the hell is going on, right? So instead, this sort of thing allows topics have an overlapping structure, which is normally how most of our um, readings would go, where you might flow from kind of one major theme to another, but those themes are not so dis different that you wouldn't continue to understand what coherently what's going on. Okay. So some words appear in multiple topics, and uh, documents can still have multiple topics. Okay. And so LDA is sort of the middle ground that finds um, those two things, the words for each topic and the topic for each document. So we're going to work with a bunch of um, different libraries today. Uh, so we're going to use TM, which is a popular text an uh, analysis package, the topics model package, which has the LDA functions in it, some tidy text awesomeness, and SLAM, which has some really cool functionality for creating these nice vectors that run smoothly. Okay. Um, so I used this example last week, but for those of you who are just following along on the YouTube channel, I'm going to import this data set. This particular data set is a list of exam answers that I had my students give me from a memory and cognition class that I used to teach that's actually also on this channel. And we would talk about attention. So what is attention? What are the same famous experiments in attention? What's exo exogenous and endogenous attention? Who was Posner? Um, how is this all related to an invisible gorilla? And so we would, we would talk about the kind of major experiments and what is the basic definition of attention and the different theories of attention processing. And I had them write me an, a, a, an answer on this. So we've got, um, uh, a set of students' answers on on define attention and how is it related to these other things. So I expect there to be at least one major topic of attention, but also maybe some mini subtopics of the different items I ask them to relate it to, like the invisible gorilla experiments. 
So the first thing I'm gonna do is convert that to a corpus. Uh, so this imported is one column of data as a data frame that has all of the students' answers, one for each row. And so I just called this my imported degrees, my imported data frame. And column one is where all their answers are. And so to convert that into a corpus object, so I can do some of the TM mapping I want to do, I will use vector source to tell uh, R that is just one vector of data instead of multiple documents, like it might expect to open and close multiple documents, I'm going to convert that into a corpus. Okay. And this imported corpus is just a special um, object type in R that allows us to do some of the next things we're going to do. I'm going to clean up my text here. And just like any analysis dealing with text, it's so messy. <laughs> You, uh, one thing that's not covered in either of these two lectures is spell checking. <laughs> but um, let's say you know that the documents at least spell correctly, which in this case is uh, a strong assumption. Um, we might still want to do some data cleanup. Okay. So we might lowercase the words, take out punctuation, remove stop words. We might also consider some other objects. Uh, and so there are lots of different cleanup procedures. There's a really cool function called preprocess in the ngram library that I happen to like. Uh, when we covered latent semantic analysis, we talked about using the tm map function. Um, today, I'm going to show you a different way to do this, where it also creates our term by document matrix. In this case, it's actually a document term matrix. So documents are rows and terms are columns. So I'm going to import, um, I have my import corpus, and then I'm going to do a bunch of stuff to it. So let's look at what we're doing. I actually don't have to lower in here. Um, so I might consider adding that. But first up, it's stimming. Okay. Remember that stimming is when we take the words and strip off their affixes. So things like um, going become go, uh, and then uh, heated become heat. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just like trying to think of some past tense verbs. Um, and so we're removing common affixes like ing, ed, s. Remember that limitization, however, is when you look up the word in the dictionary. And so you might concern, conf, translate went into go, uh, whereas stimming wouldn't capture that. Okay. There are um, not very many good ways to do limitization in R. And we had a discussion last week about whether stimming was necessary. I think with sufficiently large data sets, stimming mm, mm, sometimes can be good, sometimes not. And the nice thing about running this with code is that we can turn off stimming, make it false here, and see how it affects our analysis. But with a sufficiently large data set, I would think you could stem or you could not, and it should give you approximately the same answer because the context of those words is still the same. One concern I have about stimming though is that sometimes the words get translated into something very odd. So I gave my example last week of how the word wings, like an airplane has wings, with a stemmer, I think snowball stemmer, got converted into the letter W. So that wasn't very helpful. We do want to remove stop words, though, so they don't drown out any of our other analyses. If we're going to create prob probability distributions, excluding our very frequent words, it's probably going to be useful. Our minimum word length here is going to be three, at least three letters. And um, again, you can turn this on and off to see. This is the most common way to do um, an LDA analysis where you're cleaning up the, the text. Um, this is not the way, so obviously these all can be kind of manipulated and changed and see how they affect your analysis. And the purpose of this is to help kind of condense so that the answer is less noisy. So we could also remove numbers and punctuation. For these types of analyses, when you're building a space, remember you don't want punctuation. We only used punctuation when we were looking at coherence in a latent semantic analysis set because coherence required us to have one sentence to the next. So you had to have punctuation to calculate. In this particular example, we 
are just building this the vector space so we don't or the distributional model uh, to use their more proper name we don't really necessarily need punctuation for that okay. and so this is a special type of matrix that we would then want to wait now the waiting schema here is very different from LSA, which we used a log. Well, it's actually not that different, but the idea here is going to be a little different. We use a log in the inverse density um, frequency or inverse density function, right? And so we, we really want to control for sparsity. No matter which model we do, um, things are sparse, right? So there are less, um, there are plenty of zeros and then there are plenty of words that are, are very frequent. So we're trying to control for that uh, lots of zeros by weighting the matrix. And so not every word is in every document and not every word is very frequent. Um, and so some words are very frequent. That's what I'm trying to say. And so this will kind of help us deal with that uh, disparity. <clears throat> then in this particular case, unlike LSA, we're actually going to chop off the bottom and the top. So we're going to ignore very frequent words and words with zero frequency. Because the words at the end of the distribution, very frequent and very infrequent words, do not give you enough information, if you want to think about this as like an information criterion, where they are meaningful for just representation. Because very, very frequent words uh, don't disambiguate sense, and words that are very infrequent sometimes are uh, you don't know them. And so we will eliminate both ends because just representation is best built by words that have high information rather than words that are very, very frequent. And so that happens with this magic, um, which part of the way that this is calculated is because of the document term matrix that we're using. And it explains this a little more in the like actual topics uh, Cran R page has an example of what this kind of magic looks like. I've lost it. Um, here is where I'm pulling this from. Uh, and then you can look at the help functionality to kind of understand this a little better. But basically what's going on is we're cr for, remember T apply, T apply calculates some sort of statistic on a DV by some other uh, splitting variable and we're going to calculate the mean. In this particular case, these are words, I believe, and this is um, sort of weighted documents. And I might have that backwards. Uh, the real way to get at that would be to come over here and we can do, uh, oh, I've already forgot the function. It's not tapply. It's um, our weighted matrix. I don't want to ask it what T apply is because that won't give us the answer. We're looking for document term matrix here. Okay. And I found that this particular page for TM is not going to give me the answer. Okay. But if you click on simple triplet matrix, this is where you can start to see the um, uh, information. So I here is going to be the rows, in uh, J is the columns, okay. and a vector of values, which is not the most helpful, right? But what's happening is this is starting to be that representation of um, of these terms by documents by topics. And so we're kind of creating a weighting scheme here where we're calculating the probability distribution of rows and columns, um, and then weighting it by log two. Okay. Uh, so we're still using log, kind of like before, where we're taking the number of documents and dividing it by the column sum, as long as that column sum is greater than zero, um, because otherwise we're dividing by zero. So. This creates us a weighting scheme. Okay. From that weighting scheme, we're going to take our um, imported matrix, return by document matrix here, and only pick the options, the terms, right, that are um, greater than zero, 
right? So we're, we're ignoring anything where there are zero terms, right? And document, ignoring documents that are very frequent. Remember here, we're using a weighting scheme, so things that are very frequent have um, less of a weight than this. So uh, again, to understand this a little better, we can look at the R package information. So we're making a term frequency inverse document frequency. Okay, so our TF IDF um, over the vocabulary, and this allows us to get rid of the top and the bottom, right? Super frequent, super infrequent. And so we want a TD IDF value of at least 0.1. That um, means that anything below that is a super frequent term and we're ignoring it. And then we also want to eliminate things that never happen. Okay. So a uh, slightly different weighting scheme here because before we didn't eliminate anything. We just waited and kind of ran with it. In this case, we're going to wait and eliminate. Okay. And that was unintentional, but a really good rhyme. So wait and eliminate for topics models. Okay. And then I want to give you some terminology for some, some of the pieces to come. So alpha here. Uh, is a measure of the number of topics where low scores indicate a few dominant topics per document and high scores indicate more. It is not a literal number of topics because zero <laughs> can occur. It is a measure of sort of like, I don't want to, entropy is another word we're going to use, but it's a measure of the predominance of topics is the way I think about this. Beta is a measure of the number of words where low scores um, kind of indicate the topics only compose a few words. Um, and here we're also going to use beta as the weight of each word related to its topic. So much like a literal regression beta where um, words with higher betas are um, more related to the topic. Gamma is a probability of a topic within each document. And entropy, remember, is a measure of randomness. So um, low entropy means low randomness, which means only one topic or so in a document or less topics in a document. Whereas high entropy means high randomness, which means it's all over the place. Okay. So um, entropy is a bit of a weird one because it's kind of backwards coded to the way we think about things. But low entropy would mean less random, meaning more coherence. A little bit more math. So there are actually several different model types. And so I'm kind of working with these from um, some examples specific to topics models package, but um, a, the most popular one probably is LDA fit model, which uses a variational expectation maximization, which is almost as much fun to say as latent Dirichlet analysis. Um, and this is an algorithm that allows us to um, estimate these probability distributions. Right? And that particular analysis will estimate an alpha value. Okay? An LDA fixed model will allow you to fit, like set an alpha value that you're interested in. Okay? I, weirdly though, they still estimate alpha and give you a different number. <laughs> okay? uh, a Gibbs algorithm is Bayes, using a Bayesian algorithm to fit the data rather than a VEM algorithm. And completely separate is a correlated topics model. And this model really allows for more correlation between topics, and that uses a VEM algorithm. If I had to tell you to pick one, the LDA fit models always worked well for me, unless you're just dying to do a Bayesian model. And so these have their different um, fans, and I would tell you to, to search that particular um, algorithm to learn more. Uh, and the um, CRAN page talks a little bit more about these different particular models. Okay. Right. So let's set these up. First, we're going to pick an expected number of topics. So much like factor analysis, you have to start with how many topics do you want to do. You can always change this. We're going to pick three because I expect at least attention and then maybe some on change blindness and then maybe a little bit on um, the directionality of attention, exogenous or endogenous, and this is just a random guess for me. Okay. 
our seed, our set seed should be a random number to start the analysis on. Okay. And, you know, sort of depending on which version of R you are using, uh, this can uh, have some interesting ramifications, but um, I'm using the newest one, so I have given in to the random seed changes. Okay. So an LDA fit model here, what we're going to do is run LDA as the function, the imported matrix, Right. Don't forget we have weighted this, we have eliminated this matrix based on its TDF IDF, so it's term frequency inverse document frequency, um, and taken out super frequent, super infrequent terms. The number of topics is K, and we're just going to give it a seed. Only thing that's different on fixed is that the estimate alpha is false. Okay. On a Gibbs algorithm, what we do is we just input method equals Gibbs. And then you have some uh, base functionality, like a burn in. These are the number of um, runs that you're going to get that get dropped. Thin by 100 runs and iterate a thousand times. Correlated topics models, a little bit, uh, pretty much almost the same uh, as the LDA fit model, except the control has a couple of different options where you're allowing this tolerance to be. Um, allowing them to be correlated basically is what this section does. All right, so I'm gonna get those alpha values. Now, the interesting thing here is that even though the um, alpha is fixed in an LDA fixed model, it will actually estimate a number for you. I have not totally figured this one out, but it does. <laughs> and don't forget the smaller alpha values indicate higher more documents that are more of lower numbers of topics okay um, whereas higher alpha values mean documents that are more probabilistically more topics okay? and so you can kind of think about this as like if all of your documents are clearly topic two you'll get a lower alpha if all of your documents are kind of like well it's two and three and maybe topic four then you get a higher alpha but don't think of the number as a representation of the number of topics. Okay. Um, and then you don't get an alpha value for correlated topics model. Okay. And so here we can see that um, if we're going for a model that says that most of these documents are a single topic, our LDA fit model is going to be best here, whereas our fixed alpha and our Gibbs model are giving us much higher, kind of messier solutions. Um, entropy value, remember higher values indicate that the um, topics are evenly spread. Okay, this is worded very poorly right now. Um, low entropy values mean that almost everything is the same. Okay, it's non-random. Higher values mean that all the, the, the topics are kind of represented across documents because there's a lot of ran it, apparent randomness, right? So if you have an equal parts, um, you know, the first four topic one, the second four topic two, and the third four topic three, in an entropy model, this appears random because there is an even set of all of them. If all of the documents are topic one, you get a low entropy value because they're all the same. So we can use the supply function, okay, or S supply, to um, take all four of our fitted models and pull out the entropy from them. So this is calculated by using the posterior function. And then it's um, the, the topics, right, themselves. Um, sorry, where the function is the, top, the negative sum of the number of topics times the log of topics. And this is a calculation for entropy. And what we find is similar to alpha, we see that the, the LDA fit model has a more dominant set of topics. The Gibbs and the uh, LDA fixed models have a bit more random application of topics throughout and correlated topics is somewhere in the middle. Okay. So I would pick a model, if I wanted a simpler model where there's more like one dominant topic, I would still pick the first one. Now, 
this doesn't mean squat until I actually look at the solution, um, the interpretive dance part, which is my favorite part, right? So the topic matrix, it kind of gives me the rank of topics. Remember, gamma is the probability of each of the topic in each document, which we'll look at in a second. But I can just create a matrix of like what's the most probable to the least probable topic. So if I say there are five topics, I'll see, um, I'll see a matrix that's document by topic, and it will tell me in order the, their rankings. So a score set of five, three, one, two, four indicates the fifth topic was covered most in that document or is the most probable or the most the thing in that document, whereas the fourth topic is really covered last, if at all. And there are associative numbers with these, that's gamma. So looking at my LDA fit, now I can do this for all of them. This is our to uh, uh, topics by documents matrix. Okay. So what we see is that in this first five here, three is represented the most. Okay. But then the next five, one is represented the most. Okay. And we're getting a lower entropy value in some of these other models because the most probable topic is like probably more common. It's always number one or always number two. Now this would be great for classification scenarios. I would take the most probable topic and sort them, at, sort them that way. Uh, in reality, I might be more interested in the actual probabilities underlying these and we'll get to that in a minute. So I can also do Gibbs here. And now you can see, hopefully you can see why their entropy values are different. Um, then I can look at the words by topics matrix and the underlying numbers for here is beta. And so we can get the most frequent terms or the most weighted terms for each document. I'm sorry, each topic, sorry, topic. So I just told it to give me the top 10 words for each one. And um, what I can see is in topic one, um, we're getting like surroundings, environment, um, this is the hand study is talking about, oh man, do I remember, um, uh, divided attention task, but this is mostly about like, um, top down attention, attention, things I'm actually paying attention to, ignoring previous events, whereas the second topic is the invisible gorilla study, and so this is really just describing that study. Um, but these kind of overlap. Remember, each uh, words can be represented in multiple ones. So the gorilla and bike are kind of representing a different study. Um, but this is ignoring things in your environment again. So this last one's kind of a mix of the first two. And I can do the same thing with the Gibbs model, and they look kind of they look pretty similar, right? Gorilla actually only occurs in the second one now. Um, but, you know, given a large enough uh, text corpora, we'd probably see this convert to a similar solution. But this first one's uh, really about the definition of attention. Uh, this is a little odd because this is a typo in the study. Um, so that, that's something we would want to fix, right? Don't forget these words are stemmed. So this is observation or observe or observed. And the last one's got that kind of... Um, the bike study, which is where someone uh, was walking and they um, they kind of did like the candid camera where someone rode by with something, holding something big and they changed the person behind them to see if people would notice. This is a change blindness study. All right. Now, um, visualization, visual, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> one, two, three. Visualization is key. So uh, in all of these, we're going to talk about how to make pictures. So we're going to do multidimensional scaling and factor analysis and um, some correspondence plots. And so I think presenting people with the visual version of this is going to make this easier to interpret. Okay. So we're going to use tidy text to clean this up. We're going to tidy it. So we're going to pull out the beta matrix. Remember, the beta matrix is the weight of each word to its topic. We're going to create some top terms by using some piping here. So we're going to take those topics. We're going to group them by individual topics. So one, two, three. We're going to pull out the top 10 based on each beta. Ungroup 
and then sort them uh, descending order. I um, do not love base ggplot, although there are some new thematic options that are a little better, a little more concise than this, but this is some cleanup code that I've written a long time ago um, that makes this uh, plot pretty. Okay. So we're going to clean up the plots and uh, I'm going to show you the code and then show you the plot on the next slide here. So I'm going to take those top terms and I'm gonna um, just order them by beta okay, and fill that into a ggplot. We're gonna plot term by beta and color them by topic. So this is why you get uh, one, two, three. Okay, uh, pink, red, and, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh, red, green, and blue. Woo. All right, we're gonna use geom bar here. Right? Just give us the beta weight. Facet wrap gives us these nice three panels. I'm going to clean up so that they are not gray backgrounds. And chord flip just turns this whole thing on its side. So originally this graph is where the words are on the bottom and the weights are going up. But actually what we're going to do is just turn that so that the words are on the y-axis and the weights are on the x-axis. Okay, so let's look at that whole graph on one slide. All right, so here's beta. And normally we'd graph this where beta would be y, so we've just kind of flipped it to make it easier to read. And now I can see my terms, and this is much clearer than looking at the topics function, because now I can see their weights. Okay. Now they're not going to perfectly be in order because um, I don't like it's a little bit about the way it's ordering them or something. But I can't. There's some of them that don't ever appear in order for me. But here I can see that in my LDA fit model. Uh, top, surroundings, previous, and actual and environment here are kind of the big ones. Um, and so I would say that this is really the definition of attention. So my first topic is attention. Okay. My second topic here is clearly observing elements in your environment and a little bit of the invisible gorilla study. Okay. And the third one here is, I don't know why the word mean, probably because uh, attention means blah, blah, blah. This is how students talk about things, um, but bike, this is uh, the study with the bikes. Okay. So this really clearly to, to me, the interpretation, given that I asked the students to write this, right, is the definition of attention, the invisible gorilla studies, and then I can't remember the name of the studies where we talked about um, um, a change blindness in bikes. <clears throat> and now I can see other weights too. So this third topic has some with much stronger weights than the other two topics. Um, with the topics function, we figured out the most to least likely topics for each one, but you couldn't see the internal probabilities. So now let's look at that. And that's a gamma matrix. Remember, that's just the probability of each topic in each document. And let's visualize those numbers. So I'll talk about the graph and then I'll show you the graph. So I'm going to pull out the gamma matrix. And then I'm just going to um, group by topic on X and by gamma on Y and just throw all of them on the page with geom point. Okay. Now this does not, sh I could also add, instead of maybe geom point, what we could do is uh, label the documents themselves um, and use some cleanup code here. But uh, remember that each document has three of these because it has the probability of each one. So what we should see is a whole lot here at the top and a whole lot here at the bottom if the solution has a low entropy. So each document should be being classified into one and maybe only one or a high one um, and not really these other ones, if that's what you want. So remember, we expect documents to have multiple topics, but what we're seeing here is if there's a set of predominant topics. If these look like giant bars, that means there's a there's a wild mix of of different probabilities. And then I would say if all of your um, gammas are down here at the very bottom, what you're seeing is that it's pretty much equal representation of topics across all of them. Okay. Because in purely chance world, um, each topic has a 33.3% probability of being in a document, right? So if, if each document is every topic, then 
each document's probability of a single topic would be 33. Okay. And what we would see is just a whole bunch of dots down here at the bottom. Okay. If each document had only one, one and only one topic, we'd see all of them up here at the top and then a whole bunch at the bottom because it would be a high probability and then almost no probability for the other doc documents. If there was only one topic at all, what you would see is all the dots up here in number one and no dots and everything else down here in two and three. Okay. So there's lots of ways to think about these graphs. Um, if you just think about like what's the likelihood, uh, chance, probability, which is, um, you know, equal split of topics. And what I'm seeing is that each topic does appear to be represented in at least some documents. So it might be better instead of dots to put the document number or the row or column number here. Um, I see a couple of documents that are kind of a mix, probably. So these couple of few in here that are not solely one topic, like these are pretty heavily one topic, one topic only. And then a bunch of things that where the topic is not represented. So this to me looks like a kind of a nice split where classification scheme might work well because documents appear to be largely one topic or another um because we have this kind of split and three topics is not maybe a bad scenario because um it's not like there's one topic over here that's never represented as the most probable so if you had a topic that only had numbers at the bottom you've over topiced or over factored your model all right so all together that is a quick picture of topics models and so we talked a little bit about the theoretical background for topics models and how that's different than sort of other semantic vector space models. All of these are still considered distributional models, but like we talked about last week, there's a bunch of types of those. Um, and then there's even more like Beagle, Coles, that are kind of these hybrid models. Um, and <clears throat> the shining point for topics models to me is it really elucidates what is, is kind of the thematic picture of the data um, and uh, what how one might classify the the different documents, which you can still do with LSA. It's just not quite, it's not the point as it is here with topics models. Okay. And we talked about how to build them with their various settings. And I think the choice of setting is probably tied to um, how much variation you would like. To me, LDA fit model um, really provides one of the cleanest solutions, but you might have theoretical reasons why you'd want a Bayesian model or a correlated topics model. And so I don't want to introduce four models just to confuse you, but I do want you to know if you see one of the other ones that this is what they're talking about. Um, and so you can do a little bit of research if you're uh, trying to determine which one to pick. Uh, you can take my word for it and say that LDA fit model is kind of the middle of the road. Um, or you can kind of search and see that it's a most popular model for, for a good reason. It tends to provide a kind of a, a, I don't want to say clean solution, implying that it's going to give you the answer that you want, but I want to say that it provides you maybe with a simpler solution. And then um, some of the output that you can pull from topics models. So with LSA models, we talked about how one can plot neighbors, take two dimensions and plot what words are most related to it. We can talk about um, creating um, uh, coherence between documents and sort of how a, a latent semantic space is really built to understand the relationship between two documents or the relationship between two words or document another document put onto a space because we spent a lot of time talking about how the space choice matters. Here with topics, we're really thinking about like what is in the documents themselves and what um, can I classify them with. So to me, the choice of doing an LSA or topics is more about like what are you trying to represent, right? Are you trying to create a, a theoretical space in which you can explore kind of word to word co-occurrences or document to document coherence or correlation? Or are you trying to see like what's in these texts? Like what, um, what are the most popular words? What are, what are their um, relationship to these kind of overarching structures? Um, so that's kind of the two 
paths that I see to these kinds of models. But what people have done with them is an amazing amount of things. Um, so we talked about how, uh, uh, was it the TOEFL or the TESOL? Oh man, now I can't remember. But the LSA models have been used from everything to scoring essays, to talking about the test for English fluency. Topics models have been used in the, sh the, sh the same sheer number of crazy amount of things. So um, people use them in lots of different ways. Okay. So we just kind of talked about the basic simple picture that you can get from, a data, from the data. And then um, depending on your research question, you can then build a model that helps you represent um, the documents that you're working with. And so uh, some real extensions into this can be made uh, to unsupervised classification, like clustering, um, or even supervised kind of classification scenarios where you're trying to give each document a label. Okay. And so all that together is topics models. Um, so for my class, stay tuned. We are gonna talk very briefly about the assignment for everybody else who's watching on YouTube. The entire class will be up sometime by the end of July. So you can see what the previous lecture looks like. Um, but for my students, very briefly, let me tell you a little bit about the assignment um, for this section. All right. So what you'll wanna do in this particular assignment is um, give me kind of free reign to work on either a topics or an LSA model. And what you'll do is pull some books from Project Gutenberg. Uh, thank you again to Julia Silge for sponsoring half of this class. <laughs> um, but um, using Gutenberg, you can pull different documents. So you can go with the four on here, um, but I'd really recommend picking your own uh, to kind of come up with something more fun. Right. And so you can randomly pick some books if you'd like, or you can um, pick by category. And this might be kind of fun to have one from each category or something. Let's go with animal, why not? Uh, oh. Uh, well, this might get interesting. Let's look at reptiles. <laughs> I don't know that I've done this. All right. So, um, wow, these sound... Fascinating frogs. These sound like research papers, tadpoles. Okay, so you can pick different books from here um, in any form that you'd like. This particular set of code, um, what it will do, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is help you create chapters. Um, we kind of did this in our first uh executive assignment as well where we calculated by like uh strings of lines of text of 80 but one thing is that the book needs to have the phrase chapter in it and if it doesn't let me know and i will help you with a regular expression to get this broken down into chapter because what you don't want to have is um uh, lots of very very short text because this doesn't tend to work as well you want kind of like big long text um, so if I run this, this will take a second because it will connect to Project Gutenberg. Oops, let's try the view icon correctly this time. There we go. Um, and don't forget that sometimes this does not display correctly. There we go. So this has, has sorted them by chapter. So if your book does not have the word chapter in it, this um, let me know and we'll fix it. And don't forget that this is actually literally text. So let's see here. Let's do by chapter dollar text, oops, text number two. So you can see it. There are words there. Okay. Uh, you can also hover, I think. Yeah. I don't know why it does this, but so if someone knows how to fix that, that'd be great. Um, anyways, so this will filter out chapters that don't have enough, don't have any words and kind of merge them all back together into chapters. From there, you can run either a latent semantic analysis or topics. Pick one, one of one. Don't run all four topics models, pick one. Oh, LSA or topics. Create the corpus, build the space, and then play with the space. 
So pick one of the graphics, so you can do beta, you can do nearest neighbors, that sort of thing, and include some statistics. For LSA, this might be coherence, cosine values, topics, alpha or entropy, and then just um, explain what's happening. Tell me why I should care. Why should I be interested? Um, what is neat about your analysis? Uh, so like I said, as you're working on um, pulling the chapters, if your particular book does not use the word chapter, um, we can still make this work. Just let me know and I'll help you work it. So uh, that assignment will be due after I get back and you can have some time to ask questions, but that is the basic gist of the assignment so you can get started.